a welcome to one of three events that the dynamic duo on my right will be presenting here. Uh, at 11 o'clock tonight, they'll be performing in concert, I think elsewhere in this building. Yes. And on the 14th, they will be hosting a conversation with another great composer for film, A.R. Rahman, whose arrival we have just, we are now announcing formally. We didn't say anything before, we just confirmed it the other day, and they'll be talking with him on stage. Um, I think you probably read about them in our guidebook, and I don't want to hog the microphone. Why don't you? Why not? Okay. That better? Um, Suzanne Dahim was born in Tehran, uh, studied with Maurice Béjar, and uh, I seem to be unable to stand next to her without saying that she is, in my book, the most electri electric and uh, galvanizing and riveting performer I have ever seen. Oh my God, I'm blushing. When I right? see her on stage, I'm, uh, and part of that is Susan, and part of that is her sidekick over here, Mr. Richard Horowitz. Uh, you'll be hearing more from both of them in a short while. Richard studied music in Morocco for over eight years, uh, is the Westerner most knowledgeable about music throughout the Middle East, about music of the planet. That's and not I'm, really true, but really. keep going. <laughs> None of what I'm saying is true, but if I reveal what a shabby talents the pair of you are, people would rise up in rebellion. <laughs> No, we have two, two, two great people here with us. I'm glad we've been able to seduce them to come. And let's sit back and see what they have in store for us. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Susan, shall I start So uh, thanks for coming. I, as you see, uh, let's project this, this piece of paper here because um, I just want to get the point across that this is what we're going to be going through today. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I hate uh, actually uh, reading notes, uh, and so I'm thinking about just forgetting about all these notes and just starting to talk to you, uh, and then leaving the notes, and you can read them later and uh, go to the website, and then that way uh, it'll be a little more um, interactive because I'm also not going to wait for a question and answer period, so if anybody has a question, while I'm talking, then just raise your hand and I'll try and answer it. That'll make things more interesting. We'll add, add sort of a random thing into the talk. And also, um, probably if you have a question, that means five people have the same question. If you don't understand anything, because it, I may get a little technical. I don't really want to get too technical. But some of this, the technical stuff is really interesting because I'm trying to cover a, a lot of information from uh, uh, the importance of music in film and its origins in the universe to robotics and uh, all kinds of uh, transhumanist elements and, and a lot of things like that that all influence musical composition. So, uh, uh, First of all, I will read this part. Uh, I'd like to thank H.E. Sheikh Sultan bin Tahun Al Nahyan, Peter Scarlett, and everyone in the Middle Eastern Film Festival for really understanding how important and urgent it is to bring people from very different cultural backgrounds closer to real understanding to one another through creative cross-cultural exchange. We're very lucky to have these enlightened leaders who are in the process of making a profound change in the world. They are setting an example in Abu Dhabi for the rest of the world to follow in all sectors from the arts and sciences to the environment. And I think we are really all here to help them make this message clear to the rest of the world. And I know that's a little formal, but I think that's really important. Now, let me start going here. Hold on. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands. Who thinks that at the beginning of the universe, infinitesimal seconds after the Big Bang, there was sound or light. Now, if you think there was sound, raise your hand. Okay, now if you think there was light, raise your hand. Okay, a lot more people said light. Now, since you said sound, would you mind telling me why? We can give her the microphone maybe. Okay. 
I don't really know what the answer is, but... Just instinctive. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Anybody, does anybody else have something, that, that, any reason? Okay, well, I'll tell you, I told that to a woman from New Jersey one time, and she said to me, well, it was the Big Bang, so it must be sound. <laughs> you know? So, now, uh, how about uh, for everybody that said it was light, who would like to tell me why it was light? Who raised their hands and said... It was light. Everybody over there did. Wasn't there one person that has a reason? Or was that just, okay. As a reaction of matter, so energy is being released from a release of energy. This photon's and the photons is light, so it must be light that's been associated with the explosion. Well, and also, light travels faster than sound. Yeah. Right? So that's the, that's, the, that's the classic intellectual answer to that question. Okay? Now, what I will explain to you is that actually, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? It was just instinctive. Oh, I do you know why you were right? Because in the Bible, it says, God said, let there be light. So this is, that, that's the said. Do you believe that now? Is that, is that why? <laughs> okay, no. Okay. So, uh, well, there's another reason, too, if you, just in case that's not enough information. Okay. So, uh, in Scientific American, in February 2004, there was an article... And it's the only article I ever cried reading in Scientific American that uh, they use the cosmic microwave background in radio telescopes. The cosmic microwave background is a constant throughout the universe uh, with a fluctuation of one in 100,000 percent. So it's like rings in a tree. And, uh, and, and they use that to date the, the, the uh, age of stars. And so they can say the star is 14 billion years old. But the universe is about 14 billion years old. Most stars are not quite that old. Uh, so then they, they, uh, they found, they went back to infinitesimal seconds after the Big Bang, and they found a cord moving through disparate subatomic particles for 380 million years in a sine wave like this, right? And but wait, but first of all, everybody that said light obviously did not read the program notes, which was explaining that I'm talking the lectures about why Arabic Makam is traced to the orange of the universe. So that's sound. I mean, get it together. So, okay. Okay. So, so anyways. So, uh, so, so this cord was moving like this in a sine wave. There were no atoms formed yet, just, just subatomic particles. And then at the bottom of the sine wave, after 380 million years, the first atoms were formed. And then after that, another 380 million years, and the first stars were formed. Okay, so there was light in the universe, and there was sound in the universe for 760 million years before there was a real source of light. There may have been a proton hitting up an electron, but it was sucked up immediately. So that, and it wasn't until stars were formed that I would say that there was really, really light in the universe. And, and then they went back. This is when I started to cry. They went back, and they looked at the overtone structure of the chord. And the overtone structure of the chord, the overtone structure, that's how you create timbre, that's how you create musical, uh, the differentiation of, of, of the sound in musical instruments. And, it, and it's also uh, uh, how when you're singing the natural voice, it, uh, the, uh, you, 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 you will sing different overtones from the overtones that were created by Western music. So they found that this overtone structure of this chord, the major third, do, re, mi, was a quarter tone flat. Now that doesn't sound like much, but you know if you re if you realize that the, the the microcosm and the macrocosm are, are very 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 finely calibrated. So if you if you if you calibrate the microcosm off by a quarter tone, then if you're like say flying to Mars, you probably will miss it, right? You know. So so this quarter tone flat is actually the same tuning that exists in Arabic music, in Indian music in Persian music, and all the great savant music systems of, uh, of our uh, uh, world, and, and, and uh, basically, look, it, in Western music what happened was in 1722, Bach created the well-tempered clavichord. So, so that meant that they reduced music, that was a reductivist system, they took out all the quarter tones. So say, up until then you had all these beautiful melismas, all these beautiful shadings of, of things going in between notes like that before you got in between C and C sharp. There was all this space there. Say C is here and C sharp is over there, right? And they just took all of that out, right? 
uh, in, in, a, in a process that started at the time of Rene Descartes in, uh, and, and his uh, famous uh, saying, I think, therefore I am, when actually he got it wrong, and it's an I am, therefore I think, but we're just starting to figure that out now again. And we went through this whole period of Western music sort of cannibalizing Middle Eastern music, or cannibalizing the world, the same way McDonald's is. I mean, now look, there are a lot of great musical compositions done in Western music, but... And I think it's really important, especially here, for you to realize that, you know, just like the golden age of Islam in Spain, that all these amazing things existed in the Islamic world, uh, in including uh, the key to the tuning of the universe and the music of the spheres. And, and when Rumi is talking about uh, the music of the spheres and, and in his Maznavi and, and his famous poem, Maznavi, that's based on the Ne, which I will play for you in a second, what he's talking about is uh, is the same tuning and the, and the dervish dances and 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 this was part of a whole cosmology that included the poetry uh, w that the troubadours brought back and became part of Languedoc poetry under Eleanor of Aquit Aquitaine when the troubadours were were riffing in in these musical compositions that were uh, that were t supposed to woo the the women of the Middle Ages they were they were using this formula as it was the same same the same uh, ratios that you know, that built the pyramids, that built the Taj Mahal, that built all, all, all this great architecture, and, uh, and, and, and the same ratios that were part of the music, and, and everything else in that world, up until the Gothic Cathedral, when things started to change at the end of the Gothic Cathedral period, and then you moved in to this other kind of tuning, because uh, this was considered to be a great advance in music, uh, in the world, to have this Western tuning, where you could then modulate from one key to the next, and, and play music in different keys and, and uh, have more control over the harmonic structure. So I, there, there were great Western composers. I'm not saying there, that it's, it was a total bust and, and we should forget about that, but, but I think it's important to know that, that, uh, that in general, as, as, as we all see, and if anybody has seen the, food, the, the film Food, Inc. yet, has anybody seen that yet? Well, don't miss it, it's at the festival and basically, uh, the whole uh, premise of that film is that there's a mechanization of the American food industry and that uh, and everything that used to be natural and organic has been transformed into something that's uh, uh, absolutely untenable and, and a terrible situation because there are these huge machines creating all this methane gas floating around because the cows are, are, uh, are, are um, defecating and um, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, uh, but I, the good news is I'm not calling my digressions digressions. I'm calling them sympathetic, as in the unstruck chord that vibrates when the other str chord <laughs> is struck, sympathetic, synchronistic segues. So it's a question of, I'm connecting the dots, right? I'm connecting the dots. So are you going, are you dizzy? Would you like to lie down? No. <laughs> no uh, if you need to lie down, just let me know. I have some incense here. I can revive you. Okay. So, so, uh, so um, there's a lot more. I mean, that's probably page, up to page two. I, I, I can't remember exactly what was after that, but, but uh, you, you get the idea. And, uh, and so now that's probably enough. And, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you these flutes and try and explain to you with music what I just talked about with words, okay? So, so first of all, when, whenever, you, whenever you see, uh, whenever, see what happened was with Western music, they were stuck now with these 12 tones and nothing in between. So, uh, and then they liked that for you know, 150, 200 years, but then at the beginning of the 20th century, you notice that Western music got very dissonant. And, they were, and it was like as if the Western composers were trying to fight their way out of this box that, that they'd been giving to them, and they were kind of sharpening their, their blades, trying to cut themselves out of the box with this dissonance that they were creating. And basically, from, from and the other thing was that, see, they'd created the Western major chord, which was, which was uh, sh sharper, the, the third was a sharper than it is in, in the real tuning of the universe. So here's the real Western major chord. Yeah, very simple. Oh, wait, what's happening? I don't, I'm not getting the piano. I need to get the piano, please. No, what? Don't get what? No, I mean, it's on, I'm playing the piano, I'm not hearing it. What happened? It was working a minute ago. I guess I'll play the flutes then until you figure that out. How are we doing? No, no piano. Hold on. Hold 
Oh wait, maybe it's because it's turned down here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Now I can play a major chord. Now I don't mean to bore you with a major chord, but uh, it will will it will get uh, more interesting soon. So here we have a major chord. Okay. Now, right, that would be the major third. This would be the minor third. So the tuning of the universe actually is someplace in here, right? Now, it doesn't sound very good, uh, but you can make it sound better, which is, oh, oh, sorry. Well, uh, hmm. so, uh, uh, so say, for example, if you do, I mean, they did figure out ways around it to make it to make it work better. So th they would do something like this. Say, say, uh, you'd hear a sound like this. This would be this would be these kind of chords. You hear something cross between a jazz chord, you know, and and a contemporary classical chord. <laughs> sounds odd. Sounds strange. But so you have. to smash their way out of the box by making these chord clusters. I mean, you know. And in, in, uh, in Eastern music, you have this other way of gliding, uh, you just totally gliding through the music because See, quarter tones, think of quarter tones as, uh, you know, like the Western notes are big and fat and, and, they, and, they, need, and they need more room on the, on the bus to sit. So, so when, when the Westerners came in, they, they told the quarter tones that they couldn't even sit in the back of the bus. They had to get off the bus altogether and they couldn't even buy a ticket. <laughs> so so uh, they, uh, they, but the quarter tones are like these, these, these thin, muscular, they're, they're, they're like burning carbohydrates. They're really, you know, like active and, 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 and they can slip through this tiny hole. Like imagine if you're threading a needle and, and, uh, and the needle has a very small hole and the only way to get through is if you're a quarter tone, right? And then out the other side comes this massive expression that, can, that doesn't even ex exist in the same way as Western, in Western music, right? So, uh, so uh, here, this is, this is, on these flutes, these flutes, these are called the Nai. They're, they're, they're played in the Arab world, they're also played in the Persian world. In India, they're called the Vansham. And they're, uh, they're uh, the key, they're the key to, uh, to the tuning system of the ancient world because uh, the, the, the holes on them are automatically placed where the quarter tones are in this position of being uh, flat, a quarter tone flat. And, uh, uh, they were found in Egyptian burial tombs in 2500 BC. Uh, it's a very sad music. It's in Rumi's Masnava. He's talking about being the, the ne is cut cut off from its roots, and there are fire and tears in the soul of the reed. You know that kind of thing. So, so it's classically uh, music from uh, this part of the world is perceived as being uh, not as happy as. Western music, which is uh, more uplifting, uh, I tend to disagree. I think I think the variations in this are, and the subtlety, and some of the rhythmic structures are, are happy. Doesn't interest me as much as ecstatic, something ecstatic and something uh, uh, really uh, uh, profoundly mystical and erotic. Some place in between where mysticism and eroticism meets, I think, is an interesting place. So. Uh, 
so this is the sound of these flutes. Um, and, and this style is, is not the normal ne style you may have heard before because I mix the Turkish and the Arabic styles. And also, normally, uh, circular breathing is uh, reserved for, for the trance music and the brotherhood music and not for the classical uh, modal composition, which is known as makam here and daska in Persia and raga in India. But, but it's, it's very interesting for me to combine these together into my own kind of uh, uh, technique since I don't have to follow the rules and, and, and I don't. And, uh, and the other, only other difference is that, uh, say, in, in Arabic music and uh, somewhat in Persian music, you can uh, transpose from one mode into the next within a given composition where usually in Indian music, you will stay in the same tonal center for the whole composition. So, uh, Trilling thing is something something that's very good. They, you don't really trill like that either in Turkey or in in in, uh, in the Arab world or any place else. But I, I, it's more of a Western thing. But I I put it in there because I use that a lot in film music. It's good for building tension and things like that. So and basically, when Peter was saying, I don't really know. I I mean, I'm just telling you what I know. So what I told you sounds good because I know it. But you know, that's only like that much. And then there's all the rest of the stuff. And basically, I'm not an ethnomusicologist. And I'm not uh, somebody who's an expert in anything. I went, I learned some things, and I, I'm an artist, and I brought them into my work, and I make them part of what I do in the ways that I think are, are, good, are good to create something that feels something that I can express and feel comfortable with. But, but there are plenty of brilliant ethnomusicologists and, 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 and real scientific uh, uh, people in, in, in this country and all over the place who really understand the, the, the depths of Makam and the depths of Raga and, and all these other systems and that, that are, you should definitely try and, and, and learn from because they have, um, they have the real information about uh, all of the subtleties of the way these things really interact um, on a scientific level. So, okay, now, um, Susan, would you, should we, would you want to speak or do you want me to play some music from your website? Or um, I will just say something about what you just said. Okay. There's always, a, I'm, as um, Peter said, I'm from Iran. I, I grew up um, basically up to my almost late teens in Tehran. I 
I was a ballet dancer there. I, every time I say that, everybody else says, oh, the belly dancer. I said, no, no, I was a ballet dancer, and I also was in a company in Persia that was affiliated with... Personally, I really don't like belly dance. I don't think it represents any aspect of Iranian, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Middle Eastern mysticism. I think it just was a created um, uh, thing by opiated, uh, you know, court. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think the movement is really cool and probably feels really good, but I don't I, think I, it should. I love belly dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and he's good at it. And don't do it, though. Don't start showing people that you're good at it. So, um, and uh, it was a progressive Tehrani school. We had this ballet class out of nowhere. And I, I found it very ridiculous when I saw it and I just wanted to really tease the teacher. So I started taking it. And I very, very soon after I was very hooked and was part of the Paris National Television. We performed on uh, Persian television uh, monthly. It was kind of like a divided uh, aesthetics. Uh, on one hand, we were really, really into Iranian tradition and folk. Uh, dances, uh, and as a result, we were studying with a lot of people from all over Iran coming in um, from the different regions of Iran, teaching us how to do these dances, and they would bring in musicians from different parts of Iran, and that was how I started realizing the power and uh, the, the amazing importance of uh, folklore and traditional music in our you know, ancient cultures, um, and it Definitely wasn't from music and the logical point of view, and it was very experiential. And I think this is a very interesting discussion. Um, how, because we have a very formal um, and very very strong institutions defending the traditions of these cultures, but um, sometimes what that does, it, it brings a heavy-handed attitude towards uh, classical and traditional art forms. And uh, in the in the world we live in, and with a, a lot of you know young people having access to so much technology and media. And wanting, we want to be what we are not, and it's normal. I want to have straight hair. Somebody else wants to have fuzzy hair. It's it's this national tendency we have as humans that we want to do something that we don't really have already. So the tendency is that the Western world is, the hipsters are into like you know, anything from uh, you know, uh, mystical music from Iran to like uh, you know, amazing uh, calligraphy from China or or sciences, et cetera, et cetera, and vice versa. We, as people coming from uh, ancient cultures, were like into like, mo you know, modernity and what's the future of, uh, you know, the world, we're, we're gravitating. So what's really, it's been interesting for me for the last 30 years since I haven't been living in Iran, um, and I actually gravitated uh, very much towards what initiated the ecstatic experience for me, which was the first time in Iran when I was studying uh, the dances from uh, the southern parts of Iran, there was a tradition called uh, Zar, which is this uh, sort of ecstatic dance with this very, very beautiful music. And I was like, I think, 15. And we were into Tehrani music. It was the same, you know, disco music from the whole, you know, the, the cabaret version of Abdul Wahab with a Persian singer doing the samba version. It was like a, basically pop music of Iran was like many other places, pretty much like a kitsch thing, but it, it, it was kind of, it, it made you move and dance and it's all good. But um, that experience for me at the age of 15, when I saw these people come in and do that music and this person went to this state of, uh, state of uh, ecstatic experience and started moving in this way, this combination was the most alchemical uh, initiation that I had ever experienced at that time. I couldn't call it anything, I didn't know what it was, I just knew that this was something that um, I just had never experienced, something that was so out of my body. And that for me became like the initial point of um, trying to figure out what that feeling was because I wanted to have more of it. Um, it was grand and it was amazing and it was in my blood and it was my bones and I couldn't intellectually, you know, judge it. That feeling that we get from uh, the cultures we come from when exposed, when exposed to tradition, not from the academic point of view and not from the uh, very sort of stiff um, institutionalized, you know, not that I don't like that, I think that's really important because who's going to protect the culture if we don't have heavy-handed people like sticking to it? But I think that uh, some of that is really healthy, but some of it is also for the youth, I know I, I myself have been really dealing with that a lot, is that we have to make these, um, the tradition is in our blood, but we have to, uh, you know, by being heavy handed about it um, and being academic about it, the traditions doesn't necessarily find its way into the youth and youth is the future. Youth is gonna, you know, 
pave the way uh, and how to guide the, the, the youth into wanting to be the curiosity that we all have towards um, everything we're not and, uh, you know, modernization and, uh, and uh, te technological progression, etc. Uh, but creating enough experiential moments for our youth to realize what an amazing blessing we have with old tradition. We don't have to, you know, jarringly loud to have a flag all the time about, you know, I'm Iranian, therefore, la, la, la. It's, that stuff is like the, the, the stuff of the past. I mean, the new generation, I think, we're thinking global. We hate homogenization of, of, the, of the globe, but we also are, are initiated with our, with our cultures, which basically means that, you know, you could be, you know, from the Emirates and be an amazing um, cellist in Bach. You don't have to be doing always Emirati music, but... The fact of the matter is that to run away from our cultures to, into something uh, else without knowing the bliss of the culture, that's what's a, that, that would be a pity. So I think the difference between scientists and academic uh, people and artists is that artists, I think, have this potential and possibility and, and maybe hope to, to make the experience exper experiential for audiences for you to not understand what that was, but know there was something there that matters and you want more of it. And by wanting more of it, your tendency is much more genuine and natural if you don't understand it intellectually. If uh, you, know, uh, you come from a background that you know, hasn't exposed you to culture in that kind of way. So um, this uh, is, is an interesting uh, conversation that I wanted to talk about being Iranian and having, especially because I would have spoken different to a completely Western audience, but because I see you sitting there, I uh, feel like, uh, and you're all obviously looking like you're very much, you know, respecting the tradition. It's interesting to, to, to familiar, familiarize yourself with um, the tradition and make it very fashionable and make it something that's extremely, even if your tendency is like completely not traditional. You know, and uh, to just sort of bring that on. And music, what else but music can do that? I mean, music is one of the least, the most cosmic, and uh, it can be intellectual, but usually fails to survive, uh, you know. But it's, so it's, it's one of the most amazing art forms, and I've heard a lot of amazing Khaliji music. It's, I couldn't believe it. Six months ago, a friend of mine played me a lot of Khaliji music, and I, I felt so bad that I didn't know anything about it. Not, and I thought I did. I said, yeah, I know Khaliji music, of course. You know, it's like, but when he played me this stuff, it was just like amazing, amazing rhythms, amazing, amazing um, counterpoints, a lot of men singing. Um, so, um, on that note, um, uh, my study of uh, vocal music has been basically, I've been, I was a dancer for a long time and then I acted and with a pretty serious theater company in New York, La Mama ETC, and then I choreographed and composed and did a lot of multimedia pieces. We did a lot of uh, this one-woman opera, it's very electronic, very futuristic stuff we did with Richard for a quite a long time. And then at the end, I gravitated towards music and um, became fascinated by, with uh, singing. And it took me all the way back to that initiation moment in Iran when I was 15 and I saw this music and I heard this music and I saw this person and I, I knew that uh, there was something there for me to go back to and I have, I have gone back to it. But I have gone back to it, to the, to it as, 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 um, as tradition. I, I, I've studied uh, for the last uh, 25 years, especially since I couldn't go back to Iran um, for all the sort of you know, reasons of being a woman and performer, etc., and not being able to do what I do in Iran, I really gravitated towards a ritualistic and traditional music, but not as a traditional musician, but as a, as a progressive musician. Meaning that I've studied music from literally any place in the world. I got fascinated by human voice and all the things human voice can do in different traditions. You hear Indian music. It's always in this amazing falsetto as if someone never grew up and they always say this angelic you know, 13 year old and they have these incredible voices. Then you hear flamenco, it's just like, oh my God, it's all soul and it's all just, everybody sounds like a man, everybody is so low and, uh, you know. I was like, wow, that's cool, you know. And then you sing opera, you, you, when you're a ballet dancer, you know, you're exposed to a lot of opera. So you hear these women, you know, sounding like, wow, where did that come from? You know, 5,000 people, opera house, no microphone. I was like, wow, that's really amazing. Then Persian classical singing and all the folklore of Iran is astounding. Turkish music is sublime. And you sit there and it's almost like, you know, who needs anything else? You know, just that music and just 
it's uh, just really amazing. So much tradition all over Africa. There's so much amazing musical tradition, and especially in the voice. There's so much human voice can do, and it's been astounding for me, throwing many, many years of my life into wanting to figure out how do you do this, how do you do this, how do you do this. It's a, tr a criteria that hasn't been really explored too much because, again, the world is very uh, traditional, and the world, the schools that we have in the world have been sometimes dangerous for the the flight of um, art forms. You know, whether is you know, you have people who, you know, created the art form and then you have these people who create a formula and just continue uh, doing it. Like, there are these people who do the same, like, imitation of, like, John Colton or Miles Davis forever. It's like, sometimes it's good, but most of the time it's like, you know, where was the soul again? Where's the urgency? Where's the real thing, you know? So, um, you have it in all art form. I mean, I don't have to elaborate. I don't want to talk too much because tomorrow, tonight, I think at... At uh, 11.30, Scheherazade meets uh, Cinderella, and at 12, they're going to meet Alice in Wonderland. So that's when it's going to be our concert, and you must come. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, they're, they're like magnificent vocal techniques from all over the world, which has been really my, my field of uh, passion, and especially because also in the Western classical uh, music, which is a very, very, very powerful criteria because it's very financed, um, the, there's, been, there's been no entry of uh, very, very, it's just beginning, you know, I think maybe 40 years or so, uh, of exploring the, 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 the melodic heritage of the, of, the, of the planet is astounding. And the fact that it hasn't really entered the classical music scene is totally astounding. It's even more astounding that the classical music hemisphere has not tapped into like astounding melodic heritage from India, Iran, Zaire, uh, Sunda, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I decided that I would um, definitely dedicate my life to, to study of these melodies, to um, do an interpretation of these melodies, to bring it on, and also make it very experiential for my audiences. So when they're not intimidated by, you know, the fact that they don't know the music from, uh, uh, you know, the Inuit singers of Alaska or, or, or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm not sure, Richard is going to play you a piece of music. It's a good example of some of the things that I do with my voice, but also because of my background as an actor and a performance artist, um, we are very um, involved in film music just because that's the whole... Um, you could be an amazing composer and not do something relevant for a film just because it really, you have to be aff affiliated, you have to be, you have to love drama and you have to be able to compromise musically when needed, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's a marriage of image, sound and, and, and dramatic, dramatic content. So um, I shut up basically, thank you for listening to me and here's me singing and then Richard will continue.
There, there are two more. No, wait, Susan, I'm going to play two. I want to play the other two pieces first. But uh, just to let you know, the way that happened was is that uh, Susan got the call four days before she had to show up in Poland. Uh, and uh, she basically composed the music by ear and then uh, showed up on stage. They said, well, why don't you just improvise over the music? She said, well, you're not improvising, so how can I improvise? Because if I improvise, you have to listen to me and then do some react to me, too. So, you know, it was a situation where she, she had four, this goes on for, you know, probably 40 or 50 minutes, this whole thing. She had to figure out where to come in and where not to come in and what to sing and remember it, because she wasn't really reading music. And um, then she just got on the plane, went to Poland, they filmed this thing, and that's what we got. So this, this next one is, is the kind of thing that she also sings with Bobby McFerrin a lot. And and uh, and other people like that, and uh, Tabla Beat Science, and she does a lot of this is uh, kind of Inuit throat style singing thing that she does. <laughs> And then this one is the last one I'll play from this clip. This is for the, the, po the 50th anniversary of Polish solidarity. And why they got a Persian homegirl to sing for that is still a mystery to us. But, it's, but it was because it was a very sad event. And the, all they told her was, please sing in a low register. And then she just kind of went on the stage and improvised this. Which is <laughs> this one needs to be turned up a little bit, please, Patrick.
I will ask, answer questions. I'm not sure what to say. You know, it's. Uh, I told you, it's. You know, it really is a combination of vocal music from so many places in the world. Um, the the breathing technique comes from the Inuit uh, throat singers from Eskimo, uh, from uh, the the Arctic, and then also it's also inspired by the pygmy singing. Uh, they do this thing that they sing into each other in in, uh, in throat singing, uh, but it's usually done by two people. Go to uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. it's really really interesting. And I, for for a while, it took me some time to to figure it out. How do you do this? And then. Um, also, in terms of breathing, it, it makes you quite dizzy, so um, it doesn't make me dizzy anymore, but uh, it, it's something that you develop stamina for. Then, you know, you heard some of the classical, you know, Western classical uh, tonations in the first uh, piece with the, with the orchestra, um, Persian classical sound. Uh, there's a, a falsetto that comes m closer to an Indian uh, sound, although the Indian sound has a brightness to it, which... Uh, Sometimes I can imitate. I know I have a lot of in interesting Indian friends here. I'm like, <laughs> um, so it's really you know. And besides, uh, it, there's always a dramatic content. What's the piece of music about? What is it trying to say? Is it about mourning? Is it about you know joy? Is it about all that all of that stuff? So it's really a, a, it kind of brings my um, background as a, you know actor, performance artist, dancer, and um, musician together. Um, I answer questions if you would like to have some questions afterwards, but I think you should do the okay, rest yeah, of this, is, this is just the other side of the story. Um, Susan uh, was, uh, got a commission from the London Jazz Festival to do uh, uh, pieces by uh, Coltrane and, and uh, Chet Baker, and, um, and uh, she sings in English. And this is her version of Marvin Gaye's song, Trouble Man.
The amazing thing is that that 15, when I was 15, I told you about this initiation thing. You have that in black American music. You have that in African music. You have that in uh, Khaliji music. It, it's interesting that element, the sacred element in music, how many, how the globe shares that and uh, how we need to protect the, 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 that aspect of, uh, you know, sonic, cosmic sonic traditions we all have in different parts of the world and you know keep it alive and keep it keep it real as they said richard i think you should do the rest of your uh, conversation okay. uh, so uh let's see we have about um uh half hour left um i'll um i brought this box i wanted to show you this box this is a little technical but it's interesting because it's a it's a pretty cool story basically uh, you know about, how many people here know about virtual reality? Virtual reality, people know what that, everybody knows what that is? Girls, you know about that? So, you, you know, when you go, when you move through space, you have, you have this goggles on, you have this glove, and you can fly through all these spaces three and, and three-dimensional space. things and everything. It's kind of like moving through a 3D movie. And it was invented by a friend of ours, very close friend of ours, named Jaron Lanier uh, in the, um, uh, early 80s, and, and by the time he had a big company in Silicon Valley uh, called VPL, Virtual Programming Languages, with about 50 people working there that eventually was industrial espionage by uh, the big French company called Thompson. And uh, this is interesting because what th the reason I want to talk about this is just that uh, uh, there's kind of a war going on right now. Uh, in the different parts of the scientific community that, that will eventually affect all of us. So I, I just felt it was important to let you know what's going on. And basically, it's, um, it's a war between scientists like Jaron, who are still humanists, even though he wrote one of the most important artificial intelligence programs on the planet, uh, and scientists like uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who runs the Media Lab at MIT, who is basically in the tradition of, of, um, of uh, 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 Ray Kurzweil. And both of these guys believe seriously that all you have to do, uh, we'll no longer need our bodies and we'll just download our brains onto a computer and then we can junk our bodies and, and, and go on and, and, and we'll have everything we need. And uh, so, um, and, and, the, and the, the, um, the metaphor that Ray Kurzweil uses to uh, explain why this is true is, is he says, and Ray Kurzweil is one of the smartest guys on the planet. I mean, the, he invented the Kurzweil synthesizer. That's like the tip of the iceberg in terms of his inventions. He's invented all kinds of other things. You can look them up online. But he invented the first piano sound and the Kurzweil synthesizer, the first digital sampling piano sound. So he says, look, you can compare robot intelligence to digital sampling on the pianos. And, and um, and you can compare human intelligence to a real piano. And in the future, 
robots will be 50 billion times more intelligent than humans. And um, just look at the digital piano. See, nobody really buys real pianos anymore. This what piano I'm playing is a digital piano. And, dig and real piano sales are way down, and digital piano sales are way up. So somehow in Ray Kurzweil's mind, that means that digital pianos are somehow better than real pianos, and robots will be better than real human beings. And, and uh, this guy is very powerful. He's written all these books. One of them is called The Singularity, about when this is about to happen. And I, I'm not a total Luddite. I think there is, there's a great new magazine that came out by this very interesting guy named Are You Serious? And, and um, it's a magazine called H Plus, which is, which is a transhumanist magazine. And uh, in this magazine, everybody's talking about different ways that you can add or you know, subtract different parts of your brain and enhance it or change it and things. And, um, so, uh, and some of these things are really cool and some of these things could be useful and, 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 there, and, and, and we will be moving in that direction. But on the other hand, uh, some of them are ridiculous. So, um, so, uh, so this, this, this situation, uh, which is still sort of, uh, you know, how there was Rene Descartes, as I talked about earlier, and then there was this reductivism, uh, the reductivist scientific method, which was basically, you know, the rational thing, I, I observe the universe and then I figure out what's going on. But that changed, it basically changed uh, in the 50s as a result of Heisenberg. Anybody know who Heisenberg is here? Okay, so anyways, Heisenberg was a friend of Einstein's. And Heisenberg came up with this, called this, this theory called the Heisenberg Principle, which was that he was basically, they were studying the, the movement of uh, subelectronic particles uh, and, and they were trying to identify exactly where those particles would be at any given moment. And then he realized that because of the very nature of the human observation of the uh, reaction, that it changed the reaction, right? So you could never really know by, by pure observation and rational thought what was really going on in, 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 the, in, the, in the quantum world, in the, in the smallest possible uh, uh, things, or in the largest, the, 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 the macrocosm, the largest possible world. And, and, and uh, so this, this had a, a big influence on musical composition. I, I know this is a very roundabout way of me explaining how I composed the music for The Sheltering Sky. But, uh, but it all, this, all of these kinds of things are, are going through the head of a composer uh, as, as, you're, as, as you're reacting. Uh, and in each era, the composer is reacting to different, different events in the world that create uh, a reason to uh, ins inspire you uh, to to work and and for a lot of composers in in the early part of the 20th century, this this uh, realization led to an understanding that the the random element in in music composition was extremely important. Okay, and basically, uh, random random in music composition can can also uh, be considered to be like a collage technique. Where where you cut things up and put them together, or it can be it can be put in a, in a composition because you're playing a, a taksim or a raga, and this is something that Indian music musicians and all the music, musicians have here for known for a long time that that you don't just want to read notes on the paper, you want to take this music and make it into your own personal statement by by improvising with it, and uh, and 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 that's how you come closest to understanding the universe. Okay, so you know we're back to some of my original discussion, but but. If, but if you understand that robots will get more and more powerful over the next 10, 20 years, and if they're not programmed with this understanding, uh, then we will be in bad shape. And at the moment, a lot of the, a lot of the things going on in universities in, the, in America are, are not paying attention to this. For instance, Caltech is a big place in the States, one of the major places for robotics programming in, in America. And originally they thought that they would program in uh, artificial intelligence, crea creative robots, and they hired all these artists to try and figure out how to do that. And they got halfway into the program and decided they didn't want to bother to continue it, and they just fired them. You know? And these things are going on all the time. And it just so happens that this guy, Nicholas Negroponte, who runs the Media Lab at MIT, is from the same Negroponte family as the American, uh, uh, his, uh, 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 what, excuse me? He was the former ambassador to the US. 
No, yeah, no, his, no, his father was the former ambassador to the UN. This guy is, is a media guy. And, and then, and then, and then, and, and he was also very close with the Bush family. And, 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 uh, and then another part of the family was uh, the ambassador to, uh, to Russia. And these guys are right wing guys that are, you know, and these are the guys that blew my dear friend Jaron, the brilliant composer, out of the water, stole his company for 50 million bucks, gave it to Thompson, and then they went on these debates, kind of like Gordon Liddy and, you know, and T Timothy Leary is, is totally crazy. So, um, uh, so, uh, but then on the other hand, you know, I, I started out as playing classical music, then I played jazz, then I got into computer music, or electronic music in Paris, then I was, went to Morocco for eight years, and then I came back, and, and this bot, when I was in Paris, I did this record, this recording at, at Pierre Boulez's studio underneath the Beauberg, recording these flutes, but under extraordinary circumstances with all kinds of interesting electronics and everything, and, uh, and they were developing at that point this box, which I have here, which I'm going to show you, because because it's still interesting, and I'm still fascinated by this stuff, even though uh, I've just been talking on the other side of the story. And and basically what this box does is it does the same thing for music that that you do in virtual reality, which is that uh, you... Um, you give it certain information, like in virtual real reality, you give it the the, uh, f the physical parameters of the room and and all these things, and 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 this you give it the the length of the tube you're blowing into, and you give it uh, the, the 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 kind of material the tube is. Is it a reed? Or is it wood? And you give it the embouchure, the blowing technique, and all these things, and then it models the sound. Uh, uh, in it, uh, it's not a s digital sample. It's a real. It's 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 actually thinking about how to how to make the sound that it just cooks up inside this box, and this is what it sounds like. Uh, so, I'll give you a few examples of it. And you have to play it. You have to play it with this breath controller, because it's actually it's actually uh, uh, you know your your breath. What it's doing is it's translating your breath into the instrument. All right. But it only plays two notes at a time. That's why nobody bought this, because everybody wanted to play 16 notes. But these two notes are extremely responsive. And this, this technology... This technology is 18 years old. <laughs> and imagine what they're doing. It. So, the, so the problem sometimes it skips the notes. But okay, so that, okay, now here's check this one out. This is this is uh, this is a really cool one. Uh, hold on. Check the bagpipe out. Hold on. Oh, this bagpipe's too, too low to that. We've got to turn it up a little bit, please. Up, up more. Turn this box up. one. Hold on. Sorry. This one's really cool. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were going to go to the Alice in the Wonderland. It's like a Richard in the Wonderland. Hold on.
so, um, so no, but there's another part of the story that was, that's sort of a digression, but it's really interesting. So I'm, I'm at this place, it's, it's, sorry, it's 1979, and, 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 I'm, and I'm talking to these two French composers and one American composer that are working at this Pierre Boulez place, and they say, yes, well, in tandem to this, with the same algorithms, we're creating music that will, uh, algorithms that will be able, to, we can use to predict, predict where, where notes will fall, either in a raga or a taksim or in a classical composition. And then they sold those equations to Goldman Sachs. Okay. <laughs> That's a true story, right? <laughs> okay. And, and I think at that point, 1979, that it wasn't really their fault, but they didn't tweak them enough. So they, you know, they probably factored in, you know, like maybe 20, 30, maybe 40, 50, maybe even 60% of greed, but, you know, they didn't factor in 98% greed into the equation. So, you know, as a result of it, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, used it. And those are the equations. So but, but I have, I, I'm, I'm actually now going to pitch you this, this film idea here that I have, which is that in the future, the stock market will be controlled by saints, okay? Uh, 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 and they will go to school in India to study with gurus. <laughs> and what it will be is that, is that they will be saint musicians and, and they will be playing music. And every trade that they make, they'll be table players or some, it's the, the, every note, every inflection of their instrument will be controlling the markets. <laughs> right? 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 <laughs> And, and the story is of this young boy who has chosen to become this great guru music saint and how he's sent to India. To, so anyways, you can invest in that, right? <laughs> so how, how are we doing here? Do you want to do some Q&A? Uh, uh, yeah, we, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I know you have to go. So I'm glad I had a chance to pitch Sorry. you before you left. <laughs> now he's running away. See, he's running away. <laughs> So I think we should do a little bit of Q&A. I, okay. I mean, I, I've been asked by a very, very special friend to mention that I've done a lot of work with uh, an Iranian artist, um, Shirin Neshad. I've done a lot of uh, the, all the work, uh, com compositions for her installations, and uh, she's doing quite well. And I think she just got the Silver Lion at the Venice Biennial. And I wanted to show some of the stuff we've done together. But we can't fit in all these uh, eccentric ideas in one uh, class, so hopefully uh, there will be other occasions we could do that. But I think we should do a little bit of Q and A. If you have any questions, in case uh, there is such a. Perhaps I wouldn't have asked a question. <laughs> um, I I'm a film composer, and I've been experimenting a lot this year with um, a program that is pretty much uh, similar to the type of. Um, ornamation that you do with your voice. It's mm -hmm. called Francesca. I don't know if you've come across it, this amazing, is it she jazz American? Yeah. So I've been experimenting a lot with kind of the, the loops and the samples that they've given me and cutting it up a lot, putting a lot of delay and reverb and just really having a lot of fun with, with all that aspect. Right. I did notice um, with your beautiful um, presentations on stage, did you, it sounded like there was some sort of delay happening or were you actually doing that yourself? Um, yeah, that's I'm doing incredible. that myself. It's it's wow. it's you know it, that kind of um, you know when you create two or three different um, sounds in one, in 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 what one, one instant, is uh, it actually is it, you know you have it in, um, you know you have it in, in it really the the idea of it sometimes it, uh, the, the idea comes from a tradition that already exists, but sometimes also the the idea comes from the fact that some, I I really what I like le least about uh, Western classical music they keep teaching you how to sing clean clean because if you don't sing clean you don't project in an opera house you have to stick to the rule of creating very pure vowels taking the air out the of the voice Italian Italian language uh, the bel canto tradition so you keep learning how to do this very clean clean sound and a clean sound is not always very expressive of what you want to do emotionally and so um, so I, I, I try to mess it up as much as I can but it is not processing I mean sometimes I process vocals but in this 
in these cases, it's not processed. It's, it's just the, the stuff that I do. And I don't know in which instant you're talking about. You're talking about the circular breathing stuff. You're talking about the circular the yeah, breathing. I, just, I mean, I think the way that you, um, you, you create such perfection every time you repeat a motive that it sounds like it's just being delayed. Do you know what I mean? Like you're, the um, yeah. replication is just perfect. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's fantastic. It's, uh, it's work. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. It's, you know, my training is um, I'm originally classical, but I really, my training, I mean, you, you have to be a very, dis I mean, it, it, you, it, this is not something, I started composing the music that I sang because I had these ideas and I had to, I composed, and then I had to really develop a technique to do it live because there's one thing to come up with a brilliant idea when you're in front of a microphone and there's another thing to actually stand in front of an opera. Uh, orchestra with very little support and just go for it. So it, it's been uh, meti meticulous. I mean, I've spent a good 25 years on, you know, very um, classical training to for alignment, and then everything else is just experimentation to try to find what's healthy for the voice because you could actually lose your voice doing this kinds of stuff. So it, yeah, it's work. It's very inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Shami. I'm from Dubai Women's College. I teach media and film there, and about half the audience is uh, media students, female media students, Emiratis that are uh, studying film, have made films with me. Um, one thing I want to say is uh, a lot of these girls have already started working with composing music for the shorts they've done, little commercials, PSAs they've done, and I've been pretty blown away by their kind of natural instincts for being able to do that, for mixing image and sound and dramatic intent and all these things that you're talking about. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know if this is beyond the scope of what you guys wanted to do here, if you could speak just a little about that, about approaching a scene, approaching a film as a whole, as a composer, and how, how you break a scene down, how you break a film down, how you work with dramatic intent. I know you were you're involved with The Sheltering Sky. I don't know if you were involved with <coughs> Shereen Nishat's the feature, the, the recent feature. No, but I've done the other eight. Okay, so I, I'm wondering if you could speak a little to that. Well, That's okay. Well, basically the way I work is, um, I like to work off the written material first. So if, if there's a novel, I read the novel even before they finish the script. I like to get the script. And as soon as I get something I can go on, I start to work. And, I, and anyways, while I'm reading it already, I mean, there's all these musical ideas coming up. I don't like to wait until I get a cut. I think that destroys the whole process. I think it's much more interesting and much more imaginative to, and, and much more free. Because, well, first of all, I, did a, I directed a film when I was 20 called The Fourth Person Singular, and then I, it was all based on Bergman, and in the middle of the process I decided that I wasn't an existentialist anymore, and uh, it became very hard for me to finish it, and I decided then I was going to do, I was, only, I was, I was going to go back to music, and my music was going to have nothing, nothing to do with images, so I didn't really do anything to image until I worked on The Sheltering Sky, which was the first film I ever did. and and, uh, and then what happened, what, ha what happens when, when I'm, when, when I do, I finally got into it, though this is still fun, and I really like scoring to picture, but, but and, and it's great to actually have the image to work with, but if you, if you don't have the image and you're working without it, then all of a sudden you really just create a piece of music that stands on its own, that has all the emotional elements and, and the whole you know, distilled synthesis of everything that you want to create, and then after that, you break it down and you see now this part and this, you would start attaching things to different places in the film. And, 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 uh, and it's a much more fulfilling process for me to work that way. For me, I've had two kinds of involvements in film music. One is that because of the nature of my vocal work, I get invited to sing on, on movies with other composers, invite me to, uh, to come and improvise and sing on their pieces of music, like I sang a little bit on The Kite Runner, I sang at The, the Last Temptation of Christ, um, um, Unfaithful, I think. Stoning uh, of Soraya. Stoning M, of Soraya. Which um, you should see. And also, I, uh, it, as a vocalist, you know, um, it's interesting because then you, you know, you're there not only as voice but also as an actor, who is expressing, you know, sound from the point of view of uh, uh, with dr dramatic content. So, in a way, it's like a very open palette. Um, of course, sometimes composers have like priorities, like say, you know, can you can you be more in the sort of classical sound or be more like Eastern or um, in the case of uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, Peter Gabriel was uh, 
uh, and Scorsese were there together, and they said, could you do something that's uh, very, very non-referential, but also very traditional? I'm like, ah, uh, let's think about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but they also said, can you do something that will raise Lazarus from the tomb? Yeah, but also <laughs> they said, can you do something that raises Lazarus from the dead? I said, well, yeah, of course, that's my expertise. <laughs> So that was that. But so yeah. as a vocalist, I have, you know, this position, I can, I, it's very interesting because um, um, you just basically see the, the image and the content of the film and you, you know, you could be very abstract minded and, and usually composers are really, really open uh, to the possibility of doing something that is, um, they didn't write, they usually don't write for me, they want me to perform my thing. Um, but as a composer, and I've done a lot of sound design, which is really interesting to me because it, it deals with technology, working a lot with um, you know electronics and you know all the digital software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's really a different criteria because it 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 you really uh, need to be in a way you're just really an arm or a leg to a scene, and uh, sometimes you come up with really great stuff that's great on its own, but it's really not the best uh, companion to, this, to, the, to the image. So in a way, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting position. Uh, sometimes it feels like, oh my god, you don't hear my thing for this piece. And no, I mean, uh, the director doesn't hear it. And then you realize um, it's really, for example, for the works that uh, I created for Shirin Neshat's installations, which are in all the major museums, a lot of it because there's no narrative in her films. It's all just uh, visual. Um, Really, there was a lot that she intended, but it wasn't coming out of the image. Um, it, you really needed the sound to be almost like the lingu to create linguistics for uh, the image and for the lack of script. So it, it was extremely abstract-minded, but also very provocative and evocative. And, and uh, together, they created something that was finished. But individually, the music was very abstract, and the image was very sometimes didactic. So together, they were suddenly this expression that was completed. So choice of music is really very sensitive because sometimes you have this scene that you, know, you intended, but you don't have it on the footage. You just realize that you, know, you didn't think about it, but you're missing something. And sometimes music could be an amazing and magical uh, you know, third element and to bring out the, you know, what, what's missing. Um. Thank you. Um, can I just first of all say thank you for taking us on the most extraordinary musical journey in the last hour and a bit. It's been absolutely fantastic and thank inspiring you. and exciting. And my question is two things. Um, you mentioned about the quarter tones at the beginning. When we experience that music, it, it, it seems to have like incredibly body visceral impact. Is that because as a Westerner, we're not used to hearing those tones or is that just the cosmic element of, your, of these tones that you've talked about? Is that, yeah. is that what it comes from? Here's what it is. See the chord at the beginning of the universe? That hasn't stopped. Right, you know, so it's, it's a still, resonance. It's still moving through all of us now. That's the real tuning of the universe, right? right. Now, now we, were, we were taken away from that tuning by the, you know this other uh, wonderful thing that was created, but but uh, as far as I'm concerned, if I had a choice, I, I and that's why that's why I mean we it's coming back now because we really need it in our lives, yeah. and not just not just the music. We need the whole cosmology. We need I mean wh why who did you ever read? Um, uh, Tom, Thomas Wolf's book, uh, From Our House to Bauhaus, it's hysterical. And basically, you know, it, I mean, uh, all these buildings, all these buildings that Gropius and Mies van der Rohe built in the ghetto, they had to blow them all up because nobody could live there. And all, you mm. know, they created a lot of, you know, half the problems you have are because the architecture was so terrible. I mean, it's, mm. like, who wants to live in a box? Why, when, why did the Germans get to say we had to live in boxes for most of the 20th century? When did it be cool to have an art gallery that was all white walls and boxes and everything? What, you know, why? I mean, you know, it's like we had that, this, your, this culture here, it has domes. The, the domes are no joke. These domes, the Taj Mahal, it, it, you know, what it does is you walk in, you play a note, 
the, the, the actual structure is a perfect reflection of the tuning of the universe, which is a perfect reflection of the ratios of the mode of the, that you're playing in there. Right. And then, and then, and then it, it hits you on all of these levels that, that you just don't get hit at otherwise. You know, it's like, you Thank know, you. so, you know, yeah. Uh, and the second yeah. question is in, in going further east to Japanese music and the shagahatsu, the, the Japanese, shagahatsu. What, what, where, where does that fit into you, what you talked It fits perfectly about? in, absolutely perfectly in. Yeah, I mean, right. you know, okay. it's like, it's right. like the shakuhachi, the, all, these, all, all these traditions. I mean, you could say the same for Balinese music or African music. As, 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 I mean, what, and, and that's why it's so similar, you know, this whole thing about fertile. It's fertile. And, and, and all these traditions cross-fertilized. I mean, and, and, I mean, there was this Kurdish guy. Kurds, no, nobody, you know, the Kurds, everybody thinks the Kurds, you know, the Persians get all the credits, but the Kurd wrote A Thousand and One Nights. Uh, a Kurd codified and developed all, all of the quote-unquote Persian modes in the ninth century, brought them from Kurdistan across North Africa in, uh, into uh, uh, Spain, which became Andalusian music. He also brought toothpaste. Uh, his name was Zaryab. And, and, uh, and all, of these, uh, all of these musics have, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, they're using these smaller inter... It's like... If you go read Michael Pollan's books on food, what he's talking about is the soil, right? In the reductivist system, it, it is it is translated into agriculture. It means that that all of the 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 uh, the biological material of of, of of the fertility of the soil is reduced to a few key elements that they think this is all you need, you know, to make to to grow corn, right? And everything else is wiped out of the earth, and 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 you're and you're left with this very barren. Uh, amount of info to, to to have to you know eat carbohydrates all the time, and that's and that's the way they think as a result of the system that it works. They're very big on on saying oh, we can figure out how to do this, but you know if you, if you ask them why would you want to live like that, and to, you then know you know they say well we don't know any better, but it's that doesn't here you you do know better because you walk out you go you can see the mosque you can see all these incredible examples of of, of a culture that's existed for thousands of years, uh, you know why you know like give that. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. I, I think that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.